this opportunity. I feel very blessed, very humbled. It's wonderful to be here. And uh, I want to start with that thing I'm sure all of you have heard, this news story about the missionary out in Kenya, right? You heard that? The missionary out in Kenya? Well, he was walking down the path going to his ministry, and suddenly right in front of him comes this lion. And as the lion gets closer, he gets more frightened, so he, he gets on his knees. Oh, God. Oh, God, please. Please, God, don't let this lion kill me. Please don't let him eat me. God, please, I don't want to die yet. And the lion suddenly, to his amazement, gets on his knees, starts to pray. He says, thank you, Jesus. Thank you that this lion's not going to kill me. And the lion looked up and said, will you please shut up? I'm trying to say grace. Boom. Well, the whole book of John, the whole book of 1 John tells us that there are lions in the form of deceivers trying to create a new gospel, a new Jesus. Peter says, be careful, be alert, because your enemy, your adversary, Satan, goes about as a roaring lion seeking to devour it's a dark time in which John speaks to the church. It's a dark time because of the 12 apostles, only one is left. Nero in 64 AD had brought such persecution on the church to the point that very few of the original members of the early church of Pentecost were still there. But it wasn't what was going on the outside that was the greatest danger. It's what's going on inside the church, like an invisible virus, deadly, that was attacking the church in its message. And most of the Christians that we read about in 1 John, John calls them children. And in many ways, they are like children. They're naive. They are confused as the darkness begins to gather. And John wants to bring them to a sense of maturity before they're destroyed. And there, is very few, there are very few teachers of the church at that time that really knew doctrine, that really understood what was going on. And John comes to the rescue, if you would. He dons on his spiritual armor as the days of old. He's old himself, but he's wise. He knows what's going on, and he's going to put a, a, a new perspective into the church of what is happening and how they can deal with it. If you've ever seen the movie The Lord of the Rings, you've got these hobbits. They're like these peaceful little guys, you know, they love to sit around the shire and smoke their pipes and drink their ale, and they're oblivious to this growing darkness where uh, you have uh, this wizard who's growing in power and can take over. And there's only one person that realizes the real danger. His name is Gandalf. And he goes about trying to warn them of what's going on. And so it is with John. He is the only one, the last apostle, understanding and sounding the alarm to battle. John has three goals. Number one, expose the darkness. Number two, explain the truth. And number three, exhort the faithful. Those are the basic three things of 1 John. That's his purpose. That's his goal. And for John, there can be no middle ground. There can be no compromise with evil. You're either a child of God or you're a child of the devil. You notice that as you've read the book, how, how he gets? You're either brothers or sisters that you love one another or you hate them. No middle ground. You're either in the world or you're in Christ. You're either walking in the light or you're walking in the darkness. You're either remaining in life or you are remaining in death. You're either of Christ or the Antichrist. A lot of lukewarm people would say, John, you know, you're an extremist. You're a fundamentalist. And John would probably say to them, what you call extreme I call the authentic Christian life. Amen? 
in Star Wars, you have this same kind of theme going on. It's interesting how movies pick up these things, but they don't get the full understanding. But you have this same motif as you have in 1 John. You have the evil empire, Darth Vader, okay? And he's threatening everybody. And you remember Princess Leia. She says, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. I'll do that again. I like, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. And she realizes that he's the only surviving Jedi. He's the last one, just like John is. And John goes into battle just like Obi-Wan. But John is no Jedi. He has no lightsaber. He is not a wizard. He has no magic. And unlike Obi, he has no force behind him, but he has something better. What does he have? He has God. He has Jesus Christ. He has the Holy Spirit. And when you have Jesus on your side, you may have a battle, but I promise you the war will be won. Amen. And so, as Italians say, forget about it. <laughs> I'm from New Jersey originally. And when, you, when Italians mean something like you got the best, you know, you might say, look at that girl. Hey, forget about it. That means she's too beautiful for words. That's how Italians talk. John's opening words here begin with his question. You know, he says, Lord, where do I begin? He sees that battle. Where do I begin? And God says, why don't you begin at the beginning? And so we go back again as we have in the first chapter, the first few verses. What was from the beginning? What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, that life was revealed and we have seen it and testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you so you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. The verbs in these first few verses are, are special verbs. They imply a lasting impression, a lasting impression. So it's like when you had your first newborn child, you looked at that baby's face. You'll never forget that. It's something that he remembered. And he speaks here not as some armchair theologian spouting out dry, you know, dry doctrine, but he speaks as an eyewitness to the most amazing of miracles, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Most churches do not speak of this very much. It, it usually comes around Christmas time, right? That's when you hear it. But it is the greatest and the most important essential doctrine of the Christian faith. You take away the incarnation of Jesus Christ, you have nothing left. You might as well join a cult because you have nothing really left. You have no hope. And John says this in the Gospel of John. He says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And then he goes, everybody would agree with that. Everybody would have agreed with that. A Muslim, a Hindu, you know, okay, there's a God. He, he's something of the Word. But what John does, he goes one step further and separates himself from everyone else. He says, and that word was made flesh. That God became a human being. And we saw him and saw his glory. John says, I want you to understand that in verse 4, that you may have joy. And that's really what we have. I have not seen Jesus. I have not touched Jesus. But Jesus has touched me. And he's touched you, if you know him. And that's the joy we have. We'll never be the same once we're touched by Jesus Christ. John's opening words here, as he speaks to this church, have amazing credibility, amazing authority. I was there. Nobody's going to tell me what I didn't see or saw. I was there. And now, like lightning, John gets onto the attack. You remember your mom used to say, you can't say something nice. What? Say nothing. Say nothing. Well, John has a lot to say, and there's nothing nice what he has to say about these people. He says, first of all, chapter 1, verse 6, these people that are bringing these doctrines are liars. They're liars. 
If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we're lying. He goes on in chapter 2 and verse 22 and says these words. Who is the liar if not the one who denies Jesus Christ is the living Son of God, the Christ, the Messiah? So he says they're liars. He says also these people are deceivers. Chapter 2, verse 26. I have written, to these, written these things to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. They're deceivers, John says. Then he says they're hypocrites. Chapter 3, verse 10, he says they're phonies. This is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. Whoever does not do what is right is not of God, especially the one who does not love his brother or his sister. So he says they're, they're spiritual phonies. He keeps on going, doesn't he? He says in chapter 2, verse 22, these people are literally satanic. Who is a liar if not the one who denies Jesus is the Christ? This one is the antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. So he says these people are liars, these people are deceivers, these people are hypocrites, these people are satanic, and thank God these people are gone. Chapter 2, verse 19, he says uh, the words, let's see, they went out from us, but they did not belong to us. If they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. Good riddance. Please shut the door on the way out. Because a house divided cannot stand. So thank God that they finally left. Good riddance. And where did they go? I don't know. Today you could go anywhere and people would welcome you. They don't care what doctrines you have. As long as you want to work in the church, they give you a job, they're happy. But these people are ultimately on their way to hell. Unless they repented. Well, moving on here. Je uh, the Apostle Paul, 30 years before these people came, Paul had his own problems with these kind of people. I'd like you to turn to, to the book of Colossians with me in chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. Paul now is speaking about these very kind of people, these people who denied the resurrection, denied the bodily uh, resurrection of Christ, denied the cross. He says to the, to the church, be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human traditions, based on the elements of the world rather than Christ. Now notice what he says in verse 9. For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells what? What's that next word? Dwells bodily in Christ. In other words, he's making a specific point here of the bodily incarnation of Jesus Christ because it was being denied in Colossa just as it was being denied in John's churches. I tell you, brothers and sisters, any teaching, any experience, no matter how fulfilling you may think it is, how alluring, how exhilarating, how enlightening it may come, anything that seeks to replace the true incarnated Jesus Christ of Scripture, John would tell you it's demonic. It's demonic. And it always comes across as being good, but it's not. No end today of people and teachings claiming, as these very people did in the New Testament, to have a new and better alternative to Jesus Christ. Oh, you're a Christian, that's fine, that's lovely. I'd like to share something with you a little more that you can understand better. New and greater illumination and enlightenment. And I see that even in churches. Many people turning to all kinds of things to find, uh, you know, to find more understanding, but many times it's the devil in disguise. What this is called in the New Testament is Gnosticism. It means knowledge. It means knowledge. knowledge is a good thing, right? But it can be a bad thing when it's done in the wrong way. And we have the same kind of problems today in our world as John did then. Scientology, Christian science, Mormonism, 
Eastern mysticism, Wicca, Reiki, channeling, energy medicine, finding your new karma, all of these things are esoteric. They're all telling you, here's the key, how you can find it. And yet they all come back into a denial of who Jesus really is. Today's most, today's most popular Gnostic phrase that you'll find from people is when they say, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. <laughs> William Shatner's just written a book about that. I'm not religious. I hear people say that, you know, I say, I think I get what you're saying. In other words, you don't want to be accountable to God, to his standards or to his Bible. That's what you mean, right? Here's another one. They look at you, and you're coming to church on Sunday, they would say, yeah, I guess that's okay, but I'm not into organized religion. So I, I, I usually tell people, oh, you mean you're in disorganized religion, because that's really what it's all about. Now, there's a fancy theological term we have for people that believe in these kind of things. You may have heard it. We call it stupidity. Mr. Monk would say, I could be wrong now, but I don't think so. Because it is stupidity when you have the plain truth in front of you and you deny and reject it. The message of 1 John is basically saying, don't accept any substitutes. Get the real thing. I was over at Smith's the other day. I wanted to get some Oreos. They don't have any. They're rather the Oreos. They have every kind of Oreo except the original. Oh, so I, oh, you could try this. It's Kroger's chocolate cream cookies. Okay. Something wrong? These aren't Oreos. I want Oreos. You see, I want the original. I want what's real. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God but by me. I am the real deal. I am the real hope. You know, as a kid, we didn't have DVD players. We had televisions. And I would watch TV. I used to live for this. At night, there was a show on called Chiller Theater. And it would show all these monster movies. And I, in the films like Invaders from Mars, uh, invasion of the body snatchers. What you have are aliens disguised as human beings, and they're deceiving everybody. <laughs> you know, I could tell they were aliens because the music always would start. You know, John, is that you? <laughs> so, <laughs> I married a monster from outer space. They came from outer space. All these movies, and it, you know, it's funny, but it's the same thing with these Gnostic cults. You go to the airport, you'll see all kinds of people there handing out literature. They look like Christians, they're very sweet and so forth, and it's very, very deceptive. They're like wolves in sheep's clothing, said Jesus. And all around us, these people and these philosophies and teachings are here, and you need to be careful, brothers and sisters. You need to be careful, because even for myself, 50 years in ministry and theology, I can be easily taken by their words if I don't really check it out carefully. YouTube is filled with everything under the sun. you got to be careful. Even when people give you an account of some special experience, check it out. Test it. Go to Marty. Find out what's going on. And stay here and grow. Now, now we're coming down to the wire here. Verse 28 of chapter 2. John says, so now, you see where he says that? He says, so now, where are you at, Ralph? So now, remain in him. Oh, I'm in Colossians. That's what. <laughs> See, I told you I can get messed up here. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. John says, so now, little children, remain in him. Remain in him. Now that these creeps have left the church, you remain in him. And remain in the true faith. Remaining in the true faith, John says it in verse 24. What you have heard from the beginning is to remain in you. If what you have heard from the beginning remains to you, you will remain in the Son and in the Father. Remain. Where do you see Jehovah Witnesses in the first century? Where did they remain in Christ? They're, you can't find that 
belief system. Where are Mormons in the New Testament? You don't find Mormons. Where are Unitarians or Christian scientists? In other words, when you see these people and they have something new to share, where'd they come from? They weren't there when John was there. They aren't part of the original true uh, ministry, the true theology of the church. They come in. John says, don't go out to those people. Remain in the truth that you received because they're not a real part of true Christianity. John knew a lot about remaining. When many of the disciples left Jesus in John 6, Jesus said to them, are you going to leave me too? And John and Peter and the 12 said, Lord, where else are we going to go? Where are we going to go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Remaining in Christ is your only hope. It's like people on a ship. Remain on the ship. Don't jump overboard. There's help coming. Stay on that ship, else you'll die. Jesus said in John 15, I am the what? Don't you hate when guys ask you a question and you say, oh, no, nah, I'm never going to say anything again. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me and you will bear much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Now, Ralph Vassarno, you do a lot of things. But he can't do anything that will have lasting eternal value without Jesus. He can have the best sermon in the world. The Holy Spirit's not with me. Um, I'm just shouting to the wind. If a believer does not remain, here's, here's, you know, Christians love to ask these questions. Well, what happens if you're a believer and you don't remain? Do you lose your salvation? We're always asking these kind of weird questions. So if a believer doesn't remain in Christ, is he lost? I think John would say, uh, lady, I only know of one believer. And that's the person that remains in Jesus Christ. I cannot find anywhere in all the Bible a promise of assurance to those who do not remain faithful to God. Only warnings to come back and return. Now, if you can find some verses, I'd be glad to talk to you. But this does not mean that true Christians have nothing, uh, you know, this does not mean that Christians should be fearful. John says you have nothing to fear when he speaks to the church. He tells them in chapter 2, verse 20. You have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. He says in verse 27, As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you need no one to teach you. He also goes on in chapter 3, verse 9. He says, Everyone who has been born of God does not sin because his seed remains in him. He is not able to sin because he has been born of God. And we'll look at that for a moment. But John is basically saying the anointing of the Holy Spirit within us has come upon us and has sealed us to the day of redemption. And how do we know we are part of that sealed confessional group of Christians? By our love for Christ and by our love for one another. It sounds very easy and it should be easy, but boy, do we get that messed up a lot, don't we? We really do. John says, listen. You people are God's people. You have no one that you have to fear. You have no one that you have to have teaching you the very truth that God already gave you when you came to Christ. I mean, I learned things from the Bible. But who opened the Bible to me? Who started it all? Who initiated it all? Wasn't it the Holy Spirit? Or was it you? Jesus said to those that were leaving, you did not seek me. You did not call on me, but I called on you. And that is the assurance that we have. And John says, stay, stay here, stay in the church, because you are not an audience. Too many churches, we have an audience. We're entertaining everyone. We're an army, aren't we? Yes. You want to be an audience? Go, to, go down to the Vegas Strip. You probably see more things going on than here. But we're an army for the Lord. That's what the church is supposed to be. And when John talks about this idea, in chapter uh, 3, verse 6, everyone who remains in him does not sin. That often confuses people, and it shouldn't, because God is not asking for perfection, brothers and sisters. Until we're resurrected and we're free of sin, he's not asking for, for, for perfection. He's asking for what? Sincerity. You know, 
Many years ago, my little girl, April, when she was about five years old, Daddy, I drew a picture of you for Father's Day. Oh, really? Can I see it? Yeah. Whoa. Well, what could I say? She did it with her heart. She did it as best she could. She was blameless, right? And this is what God is asking for. Compared to Jesus, there's no comparison. But in God's eyes, we're his children, and his children are precious to him. And so when Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, it's not just that we hear his voice. He also added, and they follow me. Imperfectly. You'll never find a sheep following the shepherd perfectly. But they do follow the shepherd. Well, I've had people in my ministry who have raised their hand. You know, the old story. Say, you don't need to preach to me. I raised my hand to the good Lord in 1949. Well, that's great. That's cool. So uh, how come you haven't read the Bible? How come you don't go to church? How come you don't serve God? Oh, that's a long story, John would say. It's not a long story. It's a short story. You didn't remain. You had no right hand putting up your hand if you didn't mean business with God. God took you seriously, but you didn't take God seriously, did you? Speaking of remaining, brothers and sisters, let's stop this church hopping huh, that we see all over. Let's not be people like that. Remain, not only in Christ, remain in the church. Remain here. It's a good place. I've only been here two months, but I think it's great. You, you got a hand for this church? Praise God. We have an amazing, we have amazing music here. If you want music, we got the best. We got loving Christians here like I can't believe. They call you, they're, they're concerned about you. How many churches you call, leave a message? You never hear back from them. We also have something no other church has. We have Crazy Marty, <laughs> who happens, by the way, to be one of the finest preachers and loving pastors I have known. So, Marty, God bless you. Now, let's go into a mystery here. Chapter 3, beginning in verse 2 and 3, John says these words. Um, yeah. Yes. See what great love the Father has given us that we should be called John's children, and we are. And the reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know him. Then John goes on to say what we will be. Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him. There is in John's eschatological understanding of the, referring to the last times, the last days, there's a now and a then. You use that term, right? Now and then. Now we are God's children. Then we're not sure what we will be like, but we know we'll be like him. Paul does the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. Now we see through a glass what? Darkly, then we shall see face to face. So there is a now and there is a then. We hate mysteries, don't we? We want everything right now. And there's so many books, there's so many videos. Everybody's promising you can have all the answers. Be very careful when people tell you that. Because you don't have all the answers. And people, they just keep pushing, they keep pushing. It's like, you ever watch Lieutenant Columbo, the old Lieutenant Columbo shows? I think Lieutenant Columbo, if he saw... The Apostle John, he said, you know, I just got one more thing I got to ask you here. I, I got to tie up this loose end that you said what we're going to be. I mean, I don't want to, and John keeps saying, look, we don't know. Yeah, I, I get that, you know, but I just wanted to find out a little more maybe. You have to wait. And that's what God is telling us. You just have to wait. But listen, we got something good telling us. Because mysteries have a conclusion. Because we're like in some ways Captain Kirk going in Star Trek. We're going to a place, a final destination, the final frontier where no one has gone before. That's what the church is. We're on a destination. The church isn't just potluck suppers or singing in church or doing all the things we do. That's great. But we're heading for a final destination that's going to be anything but this. Something incredible. John says, 
listen, I can't tell you what we're going to be like fully, but this is what you can bank on. You're going to be like Jesus. Now, what does he mean by that? You're going to have a body like Jesus. So like Jesus, you too will be resurrected bodily with a glorified physical body, a transmedium body. He was able to appear and disappear, walk right through a wall, impervious to death, decay, disease. And like Jesus, you're going to recognize your loved ones. Jesus did not come back as a zombie. You know, Hollywood, he came back from the grave. That's a scary thing. But Jesus came back and he recognized his disciples. He loved them. He remembered them. And that's what will be for you in the resurrected state. You will know your loved ones in Christ. You will recognize them forever. And so John is saying this. Imagine, <clears throat> if you would, a new humanity outshining the very stars. It's mind-blowing. A new destiny with God. And what cult, what religion, what philosophy can come close to that? You have it all. You have everything, John is saying. Why would you give that up to join some crazy cult, some crazy philosophy? What amazes me is how many are telling us of their out-of-body experiences today. I guess John, you know, would like to hear what they had to say. Because John says it sounds like you've got a roadmap to heaven already. And I'm not saying that I don't think some of those things are real or true. I've studied this very much. And I would say some of these people have had a real experience with God. Some of them have had an experience with Satan. Somebody comes back and tells you things that aren't biblical. And, you know, some of these people are just loony. Yeah, I, they're loony. I mean, I was, you know, you know, you watch some of these people. So what was it like in heaven? Did Jesus have long flowing hair and eyes like fire? Oh, no, he had the most beautiful blue eyes and his hair was done up in an afro. Uh, did, can you eat in heaven? Oh, yes. Uh, everybody was eating pizza, and you can get all the extra cheese you want. I mean, they, they, they're ridiculous. And, you know, I say, well, this, is, this is crazy. And why are people listening to this? Let's stop spending so much time on what we don't know and start spending more time on what we do know. That's what John wants us to do. And then he goes on to a subject, of course, that people don't like to talk about at all in church, and that's the devil. And it's not just in the Bible. The devil's not just in the Bible. He's all around us. But, you know, he's very deceptive. And John says, listen, there's three things you need to know about the devil. Verse 22 of chapter 3. He says, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 8. He says, uh, the devil has both a demonic and human plan. He has both a demonic and a human plan. He works with people, not only his demonic angels, but he works through his messengers, people that deny Christ. The human disciples that come in the guise of Christians who are deceptive. So John says there, we first of all can know that the devil is the one who uh, sins. The one who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. Then John goes on to say the beginning here. And what beginning is he, is he speaking about? Well, th there's a myth that Christians have that, that's just not biblical. And people are shocked when I tell them this. But they think that somehow before the, the world was created, when the angels were created, that Satan fell and became Satan. That, that, there's nothing in Scripture that talks about that. When John talks about the beginning, he's talking about Genesis 3. That's when Satan fell. He was in the garden. He was God's greatest angel. And that's when he fell. That's when God cursed him. Not prehistory, but in Genesis 3 is when he fell and was cursed. And he looked at man, he looked at Adam and Eve, and he was jealous. He was jealous. He said, why should they be in God's very image when I'm not in God's image? Why can't I reflect that image? He was jealous of them, and he tried to destroy them by saying the same lie that these cults are saying. You can become like God. And then John mentions the part that Satan really hates. He said, Jesus Christ came into this world to destroy the work of the devil. And you'll find that work done right here in Colossians chapter 2. In verse 15, I'll read it to you. 
Paul the Apostle says, Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly when he triumphed over them. In other words, Jesus came, the basic truth that John is saying is that death, darkness, sin, this all had its origin in Satan, and Satan was destroyed. You say, well, he doesn't seem like he's destroyed right now. Be careful, brothers and sisters. He is going to be finally destroyed when the Lord comes, but there's nothing worse, nothing more dangerous than a lion that's wounded. I can't tell you how many hunters have been killed getting close to the lion thinking he was dead, and suddenly that lion came back and struck him down. Be careful, says Peter. Be careful. He's morally wounded. But the Bible says that he came and Jesus came and destroyed the work of the devil. And he uses this, this idea of God triumphed over Satan. And the, the word that he uses here is a very interesting word. It's the same word that they use in Rome. When you were taken prisoner in Rome, they would march all the prisoners through the main streets, shackled, so that it was seen very clearly how utterly defeated they were. And in, and in uh, Colossians, Paul is saying, that is how Jesus destroyed the work of the devil. He chained them. His authority is bound to a great extent. And he could only do that which God allows. Then John goes on again in chapter 3, beginning in verse 11 and 12, to speak of Cain and Abel. And he brings this into the context. He says in chapter 3, beginning in verse 11, For this message you heard from the beginning is this, that we should love one another, unlike Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. And I, I was reading that the first time, and I said, you know, why pick on Cain? I mean, yeah, he did, he did something bad, but there are a lot worse people in the Bible, it seems, than Cain. He killed one person, but that's not the point. God, John's going to tie this in. John says, no, it's not the point he just killed one. He killed his family. He killed his brother. And that is the thing that John is trying to say here. We are a family in this church. We are God's people, and to willfully hold back your love, your giving to a fellow brother or sister in Christ is not only not nice, it is demonic. It ties right in with Cain, ties right in with Satan. Look at uh, chapter 3, verses 15. John says these words, Everyone who hates his brother or sister is not a nice guy. Is that what he says? He says he's a murderer. You put that person to death in your own mind. I don't want to be bothered. I just excuse myself away from him. John says, you might as well kill him then. You might as well just kill him. You don't care for him. To God, it doesn't make any difference. John goes on to say in verse 16, this is how we have come to know love, God's love. Jesus laid down his life for us. We should lay down our lives for a brother or sister. And if anyone has this world's goods and sees a fellow believer in need and withholds compassion from him, how does God's love reside in him? Let's not love with words or speech, but in action. In Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, they withhold their love, don't they? They, they want to they give everything, but they don't want to really do it. They just want to show they did, and they hold back. And what does Peter say? He says, you've identified with Satan. How is it that Satan could have deceived you and, and gotten into your heart to do such a terrible thing? How could that possibly be? So brothers, when, sisters, when we deny our fellow believers, we are literally saying, I hate you. We don't have to say it out loud. But what difference does it make if you say you love them and you don't do anything for them? And let me tell you something. The first place that we should be loving our brothers and sisters are our real brothers and sisters. I see so many, so many Christians that have problems in their family. They have problems with their spouse. They have problems with their kids. I remember this lady went to Billy Graham one time. She says, I want a divorce from my husband. I don't like him anymore. And Billy Graham said, well, you know, you don't have very good grounds. She said, I hate him. He said, well, then love your enemy. <laughs> Which is true. 
Jumping to assurance. You know, John's all over the place. Jumping to assurance in chapter 3, verse 14, John says these words. We know, we know we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers and sisters. The one who does not love remains in death. So John says, that's the assurance you have. You love God. That's great. And that's foremost. But God always ties it together, doesn't he? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and then your neighbor and brother as yourself. But then, you know, John comes out and says something very strange here. Even John the Apostle at times felt condemned with guilt. Even John the Apostle. He says in chapter 3, verse 19, these words. This is how we will know that we belong to the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. John puts the pronoun with himself whenever our hearts condemn us. That's what I love about the Bible. They are real people. They are not super saints that you can't touch. John says, I, I feel condemned sometimes. I have guilt at times too. And this is how I assure my heart when I feel at times guilty before God. And then he adds in that final verse, verse uh, 20, Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Greater than our heart and knows all things. When Peter denied Christ and was later feeling condemned and guilty, Jesus was greater than his feelings of guilt. And Jesus restored him. Jesus remembered his promises because he's greater in his faithfulness than we. Paul says these words, there is no condemnation for those that are in Jesus Christ. Why? Because our judge is also our Savior. Amen. Your judge is Jesus. You said all judgment's been given over to the Son. So when I face Jesus, he's both my judge and my Savior. What a great judge that is. Just hope you find a judge that loving when you go to traffic court next time. The judge is not here to condemn, but to save us. Well, one of the worst guilt trips that I think the church has ever gotten itself up with this little cliche, sounds nice. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? You kidding me, man? I don't know what Jesus would do. Even the disciples didn't know what he would do. Every time they thought he was going to do something, he did the opposite. And even so, I'm not Jesus. That doesn't help me. But here's what helps me. I, I'm not Jesus. I can't feed 5,000, but I can feed five. I cannot heal the blind, but I can help someone across the street. I cannot raise the dead. I can raise goldfish. I can do certain things, and there's certain things I can't do. But I can do something, brothers and sisters. And as we close, the theme of 1 John is all we need is love. All we need is love. That sounds very simple. Very simple. It's written, of course, by John Lennon. I know something about John Lennon. In my last band, I had John Lennon's bass player after he left the Beatles, who backed up John Lennon and Yoko. And one of John's songs was Imagine. You may have imagine there's no heaven. Great song. When John left his first wife to marry Yoko, as he also said goodbye, he also said goodbye to his son forever. Julian Lennon said he, John even cut his own son out from his will. Julian said, I quote, For all my father's great words about love, I never knew him. He treated me like a complete stranger. How different are the words of John? Let us love not just with songs, with words, with smiles, but let us love in action and in deed. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity, this privilege to be here. Lord, we want to be the real deal. We'd rather live in some darkness and wait on the hope of Jesus Christ returning than to grab on to some kind of false teaching that gives us assurance but it's nothing but an angel of light deceiving us. 
We'd rather be people that sometimes struggle in showing love than to be people that smile and talk about it all the time and do nothing. So God, give us the strength by your Holy Spirit to be the people that you have created us to be, the church that you created us to be. And we ask all of these things in your blessed name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.